Welcome to the UCSD Makerspace intro tutorial on 3D printing. In this video, we'll go over the basic theory and practice of 3D printing. So to start off, what is 3D printing? Well, 3D printing, or additive manufacturing, is a way of building up three-dimensional objects bit by bit. There are several different methods of doing this, but in this video we'll focus on the most common technique called fused filament fabrication, a fancy name for a motorized hot glue gun that will build up your part from thin layers of plastic, molten and extruded out of a hot nozzle. Since it's relatively cheap and simple, this technique is usually the default choice, although our UV re reactive liquid resin printers may be an interesting alternative for niche cases, such as where ultra-fine detail is needed. So what is 3D printing good at? It's often an easy, one-step way to turn a three-dimensional model into a real-life part. So if you're just getting started in making, you can be producing parts for your first project in no time. But even as you build your repertoire of manufacturing techniques, 3D printing remains a strong choice for many tasks. It's good for creating one-off prototypes or custom jobs where setting up and using many other machines would be a burden. And the iterative printing process allows you to make extremely complicated structures that might be difficult or even impossible to produce any other way. Unfortunately, there are no magic bullets and 3D printing has several drawbacks, including time, materials, and precision. The printing process can take a very long time since all the material that's going to be used has to extrude through one very tiny nozzle. Typical jobs can take several hours to print, and larger projects can take a day or more. As such, if you need large parts or a large number of copies, it'd be wise to consider alternative techniques. To 3D print, you need a material which can be made molten and extruded, which greatly restricts our options. There are also many materials with desirable properties that are hypothetically printable, but are difficult to do successfully. Another drawback comes from the nature of the 3D printing process itself. Each new bit likely won't stick perfectly to the prior bit, so issues like delamination will lead to parts which are significantly weaker than if they had been molded or machined even from the same material. The filament itself is also relatively difficult to produce, so you might pay five to 10 times more per kilo for filament than for the raw material itself. Finally, there's a question of precision. 3D printers are capable of producing exquisite detail, but the expansion and contraction that occurs during the printing process often leads to subtle distortions that may cause your parts to deviate from the exact dimensions that you specified. A dragon figurine will look super cool and detailed, but an optics mount may not hold your lenses perfectly parallel. All right, so let's go take a look at the machines themselves. So let's take a moment to consider the primary ingredient, filament. The filament is the raw material which gets melted, extruded, and applied in order to create your models. We use PLA, which is a great general purpose filament, but we also offer more exotic materials, such as TPU for flexible parts or carbon fiber reinforced nylon for tougher prints. Filament comes in spools, and each printer is fed by its own spool which sits next to it. That filament is melted in the hot end, which is pushed out a hole in the nozzle. This is most commonly 0.4 millimeters wide, although some of our printers are set up with larger nozzles to print big shapes faster. The extruder is the mechanism that actually pushes the filament into the hot end. It consists of a motor and a toothed wheel. Some printers have this extruder connected directly to the hot end, while others have them mounted in a fixed location and push the filament down a flexible tube. The print itself will be grown on the build plate the part should slightly glue itself onto the build plate during printing to ensure each bit of the print is precisely aligned to the others. The print bed is typically heated, keeping the entire part warm to minimize warping. On all of our printers, the build plate is held on using magnets. So once the part is done and the print is cool, it can be removed and flexed to remove a print. Finally, we have the control panel, which is your interface to the printer. This is where you start and stop jobs, edit settings, and monitor parameters in real time. You can rotate the front dial to navigate the interface and press on it to confirm a selection. So now let's talk about setting up for your first 3D print. 
The most empowering aspect of 3D printing is the ability to design and create your own parts. There are numerous applications that you can use to craft your models, and you're welcome to use whichever fits your prior experience and use case. Just export your part as a STL or OBJ format and you're ready to go. That being said, 3D design is beyond the scope of this video. So if you don't have a specific part you're looking to print right now, a simple way to jump into 3D printing is to download free pre-existing models from an online resource, such as printables or Thingiverse websites. The most popular models on these sites tend to be well-designed and optimized for 3D printing, so they can be good examples of thoughtful design. Our laptops also have a few quick and easy prints available on the desktop you can grab. While 3D printers can make a wide variety of parts, it's valuable to bear in mind their strengths and weaknesses as you go about designing your part and setting up the print. So, since prints are made layer by layer, we can take advantage of this to build assemblies of multiple parts in their assembled state, removing the need to assemble them manually. However, we also need to be aware of some of the downsides to this layer-based approach. Since each new layer depends on support from the previous one, we need to be careful about features like extreme overhangs that could cause issues. As a last resort, our printing software can be configured to add sacrificial breakaway supports, but this is a wasteful and imperfect solution, so it's best to try to find a design and printing orientation that minimizes these issues. But lastly, it helps to bear in mind that individual layers don't adhere perfectly to each other. So if your part is going to be under stress, you may want to try to print it so that your layer lines aren't going to be a failure point. So let's talk about setting up a print using the slicer software. Slicing is the process which converts your 3D model into a set of instructions that the printer can follow to produce it. We use Prusa Slicer software for this, which you can easily download onto your computer, but you may want to use one of our loaner laptops or the computers we have here, which have our settings already configured. So we'll start by launching Prusa Slicer, and we can click Add to import a file. With your model loaded, you may want to manipulate it using the buttons on the left of the screen. Perhaps you want to move it to make space for another print. Or you may need to scale this part to change its size. Perhaps one of the most convenient things to do is to use the place on face button in order to choose the orientation that is going to be down against the bed. On the right side of the screen, are a few basic settings that we may want to set or at least verify before getting started. At the top is the print settings, which quickly define the layer height and some other parameters. 0.2 millimeter speed is probably a good starting point. Next, we want to make sure that we've got the right material selected. In this case, generic PLA is what we're going to be using in the vast majority of cases. Next, we want to make sure we've got the right printer selected. In this case, the original Prusa Mini is what we have uh, the most of. So that'll be your go-to option. Although if you have a larger print, you may want to use one of the Prusa i3 machines. The next option down, Supports, is used when portions of your model will not be adequately supported, as we had mentioned before. You can paint them on manually, or you can choose from a few different ways to have the software automatically generate them on its own. The next parameter is infill, which defines how much of the interior space of your model is filled or made solid. Normally, to save materials and time, models are filled with a structural mesh, and this infill parameter determines what percentage of the space is occupied by plastic versus air. 15 to 20 percent is a good default and results in a surprisingly rigid part. You can increase this number, but it often isn't a cost-effective way of making it stronger. Lastly, we can add a brim, which might be a good idea for parts that have a relatively small surface area in contact with a print bed. By adding in a bit of sacrificial material, the part will glue itself better to the bed, which is going to increase our reliability. Once you're done choosing your settings, click the Slice Now button at the bottom. We've now created the toolpaths necessary to make this part. With the slicing done, Prusa Slicer will now switch to showing us a rendering of the toolpaths it's generated based on your model and your settings. This is a great opportunity to see how your print settings translate into reality 
And it also gives you the opportunity to perform a sanity check and verify that there aren't any problems in your print. Is the first layer of the print going to sit securely on the bed? Do your supports show up where you want them to? Are there any thin areas which may be problematic? One of the best tools to analyze your print job is to use the slider on the right side of the screen. This lets us view each layer individually in a cutaway view. So we can see here in red, the infill that's filling in these solid sections. Remember, set at 20%. We can also see in green, the areas that are added in as the sacrificial support material to help with this overhang to print more reliably. And lastly, we can also see down on the very first layer, our brim that's adding in this sacrificial peel away part that will increase the surface area so this part can print well. Now, lastly, what we're gonna to wanna to do, now that we've sliced the part, we can see some info about how much this is gonna to cost to make in terms of material, as well as the time it's going to take to print it. So we can see here, this print is gonna take 17 grams, which is gonna cost us roughly 43 cents worth of material. And it'll take about an hour and a half to print. If everything looks good here, we can go ahead and transfer it to the machine by grabbing the thumb drive from that printer that we're going to use, insert it into the laptop, and then click on the export button to export this to the SD card, naming it as appropriate, if you wish. We can say save, and then eject the thumb drive before grabbing it and heading back to the printer. So with our file ready to go on the USB drive, we'll head back over to the printer and queue it up to go. So first things first, we'll make sure that the printer is ready to start our print. So if there's anything left on the printer bed, we'll want to remove that. To help the print stick to the bed well, it's never a bad idea to take one of these alcohol wipes and clean off any residue that may be on the build plate itself. We also wanna make sure that we've got the right material loaded into this machine and it's the color that we like. And now we can grab our USB drive, insert it into the printer, and it will automatically queue up the most recent file on there, which is ours. And all I'll have to do is just click the knob to say print, and it will start heating itself up in preparation to print our part. So as the print is starting, we have to be very careful that we watch it and make sure we monitor for any mistakes, any problems that may arise. And the beginning of the print is the best time to see that. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking to see that the first layer is sticking properly to the bed. If there's any kind of miscalibrations, we're gonna see the part start to peel up. Once that first layer is down and looking good, we can start to allow ourselves to be distracted. Never hurts to check in on it periodically, but once it's looking good, it's stuck down well. It's not looking too thin or, or appealing. We're good to go. And we can let the printer go and finish the print. All right, well, now that our part is finished, all we gotta do is lift the build plate off of the table, give it a nice little flex, and here's our part. So, we're gonna wanna take away the trash and dispose of that, leave it clean for the next user, put the table back, and now we can go ahead and remove our brim, as well as our infill here, our, uh, our support. This is often done best with a pair of pliers. Uh, 
Or sometimes if you're lucky, you can just snap it right off. And there goes our support material. Uh, and our part is done. So that's it. Thanks for watching, and I hope you give it a try.